go and the Lord be with you. The Lord preserve you. The Lord defend you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen. John chapter 18. We are going to read from verse 1 to verse 9. John chapter 18. We are going to read from verse 1 to verse 9. We are still continuing our series of teachings for this month titled, The Good Steward. The Good Steward. John chapter 18. We are going to read from verse 1 to verse 9. John 18 from verse 1 to verse 9. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 9. The Bible says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Shedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, covered thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Verse 4. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answer him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell on the ground. Your enemies will fall to the ground forever. In the name of Jesus. They will never stand up. In the name of Jesus. Verse 7. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. Please pay attention to that verse 8. We're talking about the good steward. My emphasis is on this verse 8. John chapter 18 verse 8. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the same I be fulfilled which is spake of them, which thou givest me, have I lost none. The good steward. I shared with us at the beginning of this message, and probably I believe I've been consistently saying this at the beginning of all the messages this month, that the teachings is divided into four parts, four parts, okay? We're going to be looking at what a steward is or who is a steward. We're going to be looking at how to offer acceptable stewardship. We're also going to be considering the kinds of stewardship that exist. And then we're going to be closing by knowing the hindrances to acceptable stewardship. Hindrances to acceptable stewardship. Glory be to God. I'm going to add another definition to our our definition of stewardship like I've done in the past. All right. For example, last Sunday, I shared with us that a steward is a custodian. Okay. The custodian is not the owner. He has just been given the charge over that thing, whatever that thing is. Okay. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing with us by letting us know by way of introduction that a steward can also be likened to a keeper a keeper a keeper somebody who has been given the responsibility to keep all right that which has been committed into her hands a steward can be likened to a keeper who will not allow anything committed into his hands to get lost even at the risk of his personal comfort or security. 
even at the risk of his personal comfort or security. In the scripture we read, we just read an account of how Jesus was attacked at night because one of his disciples betrayed him. But this was not a surprise to Jesus, right? The Bible says, for he himself knew all things that was to befall him. He knew that this was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. So he was not surprised. But I want you to pay attention to the attitude that Jesus demonstrated here. Which is one of the reasons why Paul said in Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20, called him a good shepherd or a good keeper. Look at the attitude he demonstrated. In the face of danger, in the face of danger, go back to that verse 8 of John chapter 18 and you will see what I'm talking about. In the face of danger, Jesus said to them, I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these other ones go away. Don't touch them. Don't harm them. Don't hurt them. This is me. Deal with me. Deal directly with me. That is the attitude of a keeper. That is the attitude of a good steward. Whatever has been committed into their hands, they are able to keep even at the risk of their personal comfort or safety. Jesus was saying, hey, you can do anything to me. But these ones that have been given to me, I will keep that it may be written that all thou givest me, I lost none. I was able to keep all. Glory be to God. So a, 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 a good steward is a keeper who would not mind discomfort and who would not mind his own safety just to ensure that that which has been given to him is kept. A keeper exhibits the character of a true shepherd. That is how shepherds are. You know, in certain parts of the country, in West Africa, in Nigeria, there are some cattle, livestock, that some people have placed more value on than human life. While that is extreme, but the attitude can be channeled positively. While I don't support the killing of man for animals, or I don't support any group of people that feel they have a right to encroach on other people's property, I want to draw and emphasize a lesson that can possibly come out of that attitude. And that is the, 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 the lesson of a good shepherd. A good shepherd will do all it can to keep the sheep. It will do all it can to keep the sheep from bears, from wolves, from snakes, from diseases, from infections, even from the elements. He will build a shed. He will build a, 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 a ranch. He will take them to where they can feed on good pasture. And when the sheep goes astray, like we have learned, he will take the sheep, break its leg, so that the sheep doesn't have the capacity to go astray anymore. These are all attitudes of a good shepherd. A good steward is also a good shepherd. You can liken a good steward to a good shepherd. Everything the shepherd does to keep and preserve the sheep or the flock is what a good shepherd also imbibes glory be to god so uh, and somebody may be saying but i'm not a, i'm not a farmer i don't i don't have a livestock your flock could mean different things as a pastor your flock is your congregation your sheep is your congregation now i'm not saying break their legs or anything like that but correct them when necessary okay for a teacher their, their flock is their student, their pupil, right? For a businessman, a business person, or even an employee, 
your flock, your sheep in this context is the product, the service that you offer to others. So you must bring the attitude of a good to work, guide and guard. In fact, there's something about privacy or proprietary in business that every successful business or businessman will guide and guard jealously. It is their core competence. This is their trademark. So every employee and every business owner knows well to guide this flock or this sheep. Glory be to God. So a good shepherd, I mean a good steward, is a keeper like a good shepherd. Everything the shepherd would do, the keeper or the good steward would do the same. Jesus in Hebrews 13 20 was likened to a good shepherd because he exhibited these qualities. All of these things, every time he made sure that his sheep, his flock, was in peace. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. The Bible says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, every characteristics or attributes of a good shepherd is what a good steward does. A shepherd is not a hireling, a keeper is not a hireling. They don't come with that attitude of it's not my business and that literally. They don't come with I'm only here for a while. They don't come with I have my plan, this is my side gig. Every true shepherd focuses his attention on sheep. Do you know that it's interesting that shepherds have only one business at a time. They don't try to do two jobs or two things. They are focused. Good shepherds are focused on the sheep. A keeper or a good steward is also focused on his sheep, whatever that sheep is in his context. Glory be to God. If you are a good shepherd or a good steward, you must know the condition the state of your flock, the condition, the state of your sheep. Proverbs 27 verse 23. Proverbs 27 verse 23. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 23. A good steward must know the condition of what has been commissioned into his hands. What has been kept in his hands what the state of his flock or his sheep is. Proverbs 27 and verse 23, the Bible says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Be thou diligent. It takes diligence to know the state of your flock. It said, Be thou diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to thy hurt. Glory be to God. You must be diligent as a shepherd to know how your sheep is really doing. The sheep may pretend, the sheep may lie, the sheep may, 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 may be shy to tell you exactly how it is, but you must do your due diligence to find out how your sheep is really doing. Number two, you must be ready to defend every sheep or the flock that has been kept, given in your care. 
You must be ready to defend the call of God upon your life. You must be able to defend the reason why you first believed as a good steward. So we're not just talking about material things to defend. We're also talking about immaterial things that we need to defend. For example, David said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 to 37, he gave us an account of how he kept that which was committed to his care. 1 Samuel chapter 17, We're going to read from verse 34 to 37. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 to 37. And David said unto Saul, First Samuel 17, verse 34 to 37. David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his bed and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. A good shepherd, a good keeper would stand up in defense of that which has been committed into his hands. A good shepherd will wade off every threat to that which has been committed into his hands. Number three, a good shepherd will maintain the flock. Will maintain the flock. Keep it in order. Keep it well. Organize it. Just like Joseph did to his, his, his boss's house, his boss's estate, Potiphar. He was the keeper of it. He was the keeper of it. He kept that which was committed into his hands. You can see that story in Genesis chapter 39. Everything that was done, Joseph was the doer of it. Genesis 39, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6. Number 4, a good shepherd, a good keeper, a good steward, must provide guidance and direction to the flock. Just like Moses did. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 1. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Moses was keeping his father-in-law's flock. Jethro. He was keeping Jethro's flock. And he gave them direction. He gave them leadership. He didn't let them do what they wanted. He gave them a vision to follow. Then Exodus 3 verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the priest of Midian. His father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. He led them. He led them. He provided leadership. He provided guidance. He provided counseling. He provided vision to them. Everything committed into your hands, whether a small crowd, a big crowd, whether an item, whether a material or immaterial thing, you must know the purpose for it. You must channel your energy to ensuring the purpose of it is achieved. That is what makes a good steward. Finally, number five, a good shepherd, a good steward, a good keeper will correct the flock as necessary. Jethro corrected Moses. Huh? 
David said, Though I walk through the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, verse 4. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Correction is part of the stewardship of every one of us. Whoever is watching or over you has the right to correct you. You must not shy from that and you must not be shy from giving that correction to those who God has given you charge over. Glory be to God. Now let's move to the second leg talking about how do you offer acceptable stewardship? How do you offer acceptable stewardship? You offer acceptable stewardship among many others by being available to serve. I said in my note here, I said, since a good steward is a keeper, he or she must be available to tend to keep something. You must watch over it 24 hours, 7 days a week. Remember we said a keeper or a good steward does not mind sacrificing personal comfort, personal pleasures, personal leisure. They are always available. They are always available. Keeping the flock requires availability to serve them. For example, it is a man's availability to serve God that provokes God to make him great. A good steward lead, needs little or no encouragement to make himself available to serve. Little or no encouragement to provide time out of no time. You know everybody says that? No time. I don't have time. I don't have time. People have time for what they care about. People make time for what they care about. So a good steward is careful not to deprioritize that which has been committed in science. So he makes him himself available. Available. The call to stewardship is not primarily based on capacity, but on availability. Thank God for capacity. But if capacity is not available, availability will bring capacity. Glory be to God. So, call to serve. To offer acceptable stewardship, you must be available. You must be available. You must make time available. Make resources available. We're going to get to that in a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. To emphasize this point on availability. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. God does not use the strong, the capable. He chooses the, the foolish things of this world to confirm the wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. Verse 26 to 29, I'm sorry. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. The Bible says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Do you see that? Because they are not available. They have strength. They have nobility. They have capacity capacity but they are not available so they are not called verse 27 the bible says but god has chosen the foolish things of the world to confront the wise and god has chosen the weak things of the world to confirm the things which are mighty and the base things of the world are things which are despised had god chosen yea the things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why you can find a boy who nobody knows. But he's available. He spends time in the word of God and in prayers and in service to the Lord. You will see him rising. 
And before you know it, God puts him high up. That's because he may not be mighty, he may not be noble, but he's available. A good seaward makes himself available. For example, Elisha was another man that was available. He was available all the time to pour water on the hands of Elijah. He was so available that nobody else did it. <laughs> you know, when you are doing a job and you, 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 you go on a vacation, somebody else comes and does it in your stead. But no, not Elisha. He was 100% available to pour water on the hand of his boss, Elijah. 2 Kings 3 verse 11 tells us that. He was always available. No wonder he became great. When you become available, God will begin to elevate and promote you into realms that you have never dreamt of. Just be available to serve him. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Number two, to offer acceptable stewardship, not only must you be available, you must do it in love. This is very vital and very critical. In fact, I'm going to spend more time on this one because this is the crux. This is the heart of service. It's love. Any kind of service that is done outside of love does not count. First Corinthians 13 verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Any kind of service, any kind of stewardship that is not done with love does not count. It's not acceptable. Love must be present. Love makes every stewardship available, acceptable. Only stewardship offered in love can be accepted by God. For example, David's stewardship was acceptable because of his affection for the house of his God. First Chronicles 19, verse 2 to 3. His stewardship was acceptable because he had an affection for the house of his God. Solomon also had his service acceptable to God when he loved the Lord. First Kings 3, verse 3. 1 Kings 3 verse 3, the Bible says, And Solomon, let's read that together. And Solomon loved the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Glory be to God. And Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statuses of David his father, only he sacrificed and burned incest in high places. And when he did that, because of the love that motivated that sacrifice, that motivated that service, God appeared to him in First Kings chapter 3, verse 5. The Lord appeared to him and said, Ask me anything that you want. I see God appearing to somebody today. In the name of Jesus Christ. When his heart turned against God, God did not appear. First Kings chapter 11, verse 3. First Kings chapter 11, verse 3. The Bible says, Now Solomon loved many women. First Kings 11, verse 1. First Kings 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. He loved many strange women. So his service was no longer acceptable. Because the love for God had left. So how do you demonstrate your love for God? You may be asking, how do you know if I love God? Love is measurable. Love is actionable. Love is not intangible. 
It is tangible. You can know there are certain indices. When you start seeing some of these things going down in your life, you need to check yourself and bring yourself back to shape. Because it always indicates that the love level has dropped. What are some of those things? Number one is your addiction to the things of God. When you are bored by the things of God, your love level is going down. When you fall out of love with the person, you don't want to talk to them. You don't want to hear from them. You don't want to even see them. When you start getting bored with worshipping God, and I'm not talking about only in church, but even outside of church, when you are you are bored, you are uninterested, disinterested in the things of God, your love meter is reading low. When messages, Christian books, Christian programs begin to become a burden to you, please check your love life for God. It's often is an indication that it is going low. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added to you. Make, it, make yourself an addict of it. Whatever controls your time, controls your life. So when you are controlled by the demands of the kingdom of God, your life will be easy. So make sure that you are surrounding your life, yourself, always with the word, with prayers, with the things of God. Gospel songs, gospel music, spiritual songs. Just make sure you are always in that environment and that atmosphere. Prayers, yes. Be addicted to those things and your love for God will go higher. Number two is in obedience to God. Anytime you find yourself disobeying God, your love meter is going down. Do something quickly. Talk to somebody. Begin to make restitutions. Jesus said in John 14, 15, John 14, 15, he said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Obey my instructions. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience to God is a proof of love for God. Obedience to God is a proof of love for God. Number three, I'm only giving us five ways and then we will start to wrap up. <laughs> Glory be to God. Number three, how do you demonstrate your love for God? Number three, by promoting God's cause with your money. Yes. I will know what you love when I see where you spend. If I see you spend on clothes, even if you try to lie to me, you don't like clothes, I will not believe. If you spend more on clothes, I, will, I can tell you love clothes. If you spend more on vacations, I can tell you love vacations. If you spend more on food, no matter how skinny you are, I can tell you love food. Wherever you spend the most is what you love the most. So if I see you spending more about the things of the kingdom, the things that propagates and expands the kingdom of God, for example, in your tithe, your offerings, your giving to the poor, to the needy, to your parents, to your family, giving for kingdom causes, people that are in distress. Uh, when I see those things, then I can tell that you love the things of God. Anything that is a cause for God, a church may be building a facility, you know, uh, people may be providing relief, effort to some distressed areas around the world. You know, the church may need something where you worship, even if they don't announce it. And even when they do announce it, you rise up to that cause. You don't let the things of God fall to the wayside. Then you can claim to be in love for God. Praise God. 
David said in First Chronicles 29 3. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3 said, Because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. I have pre prepared of my own proper good, that is his own money, not his money as a king or not his money as a, as, as a man of God. His own money because of the affection for the house of God. Where you spend reflect what you love. So spend for kingdom cause. Spend for kingdom cause. Spend for kingdom cause. There is a palace in Lagos, Nigeria, or in Nigeria where I grew up. I'm going to try to say it the way it said and I'll interpret it. And maybe some of you will understand it when I interpret it. Or when I say it, they always say, if you chop alone, you die alone. That is, if you eat alone, if you spend your money alone, you will die alone. So you must promote God's cause. Promote concerts. Your friends are hosting a concert like the women's conference we're having. It's a great opportunity. Call and see how you can serve. Call and see what you can give. Those are ways to show that your love for God is still on fire. Love is not emotional. Love is practical. You don't sing, I love you, and do nothing about it. No. Show me your faith by your works, and I'll show you my faith by your works. Love is work. Love is actionable. May the Lord give us understanding. Greater understanding in Jesus' name. Number four is loving people you can't claim to love god if you don't love people mm -mm. Mm -mm. i know you may be an introvert but an introvert is not somebody that hates people <laughs> if your definition of an introvert is somebody that hates people you have a hate problem you are not an introvert you are only hiding under the skin of an introvert on your inside is what we need to check and change. You want to you you want to demonstrate your love for God, demonstrate it by loving people. The Bible says that expressly, first John chapter 4, verse 20 to 21. First John chapter 4. Please write these scriptures down. First John chapter 4, verse 20 to 21. If a man say I love God and hated his brother. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. Whoever claims to love God must love his brother. You must love people. You must love people. You must do something to make sure that humanity gets better. You must do something to improve humanity. Your compassion for people is an indication of your love for God. Finally, your delight in going to church. I'm telling you, especially in this part of the world, in the western part of the world, many, many fake lovers of God exist. Fake! They will do everything and go everywhere else but church. They will go everywhere else and accommodate and tolerate every other person, but not people of God. The same things they accuse people of doing at church, they do it at their jobs, but they will still go to work. They do it in their communities, but they won't move out. They do it in their country, but they won't leave the country. The same thing they are accusing the church of. David said in Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, Come, let us go into the house of the Lord. And the Lord called David a man out of his own heart. He was a man after God's own heart because he loved going to the house of the Lord. I come to my emphasis. Interestingly, some people think I'm trying to, uh, I'm saying this because I want the people to fill the church. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. What's wrong with that? I want people to come and fill the house of the Lord. I want people to fill Tola. But much more importantly, I want you to use that as a proof of your love for God. As your love for God. I want your love for God to always be on fire. And one of the ways is to always show up. Show up in the house of the Lord. Praise God. We just ended the first and the second leg of the message. Let's quickly go into the third leg and talk about the kinds of stewardship. The kinds of stewardship. I've talked about various kinds. I've talked about financial stewardship. I've talked about spiritual stewardship, which is in prayer and fasting. I've talked about, for example, last Sunday, we talked about witnessing, outreaches as a form of stewardship. Today, I want to add to that by saying that we can exercise our stewardship by serving God with our skills, with our talents, with our expertise, with our intellect. Many people don't know that, that your intellect was given to you by God to serve him. There are some people with the wisdom of the world that God wants us to use the wisdom of God that he has given to us to bring to subjection. Not to humiliate them, but to humble them by the manifest wisdom of God. So, our intellect is an asset to the kingdom of God. It's an asset. It's an asset. The wisdom of the world, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6. So, God wants us to use our intellect. And not only our intellect, but even our influence. You have 500,000 followers on YouTube. You have a million on Instagram. You have on Twitter. You have on Snapchat. You have on threads. Whatever influence you have, even in the community, in person, God wants you to use that influence to serve him. It's very important. Your skills must be donated in church. You know, church is a multifaceted organization. In church, you need accountants, lawyers, you need everybody. It's like a, it's an organization. Huh? You need nurses, you need doctors, you need engineers, you need everybody at church. All contributing those skills towards propagating the kingdom of God. They shouldn't need a faucet to be fixed in your church and you're a plumber and you don't do that. You, uh, you don't volunteer to do that. You don't do that for, even for free. Where is your love for God? You may be an electrician. You may be a project manager. You may be a firefighter. You may be a teacher. Yes, we need every one of those skills in church. Praise God. Maybe a politician, a leader. Yes, a business owner. Absolutely. You can serve as a business leader in church, business coaching, business seminars. You can do all sorts of consultations for other business owners, all within the context of the church. So pay attention to that and make full proof of your stewardship. You are two years in business, you know better than somebody that hasn't started. Serve the church. Serve God with that two years of experience. You have six months. You have three months. You can always find somebody or an opportunity to serve God with that experience, with that influence, with that skills, with that expertise. Don't be like that one man given one talent that went and dug the ground and hid it. Don't say you're two months. I've only been doing this for two months. I can't serve with it. I I'm waiting to be very good. <laughs> I want you to be very good at this before I can serve with it. No. Serve with what you have. And the Lord will give you more than you have now. In Jesus' precious name. Finally, let's look at the fourth leg of the message and then we close. Hindrances to serving God. And I'll just pick one. Hindrance to serving God acceptably is covetousness. Covetousness. 
covetousness. A good steward must not be covetous. Covetousness needs leads to stealing, pilfering. You must be content as a good servant. If you are not content, your stewardship will not be acceptable. It's an hindrance. It's an hindrance. You must be content. You must be content. You must remember that you cannot take what is your master's. You cannot take what is your master's. Your master gave it to you, put it in your hands, does it make it yours? He put you in charge, he gave you rulership over, it doesn't make you number one. You are still number two or number three or whatever number it is. Joseph knew this fact. And so when Potiphar's wife came to him, he said, no, I'm a good steward of what everything my master has given to me in this house and I will not abuse that privilege. We have a lot of people in the body of Christ today abusing the privilege. We have some people abuse the congregation, abuse volunteers in the church, talk to them rudely, rudely harshly, no respect. They, con they uh, cajole them, they con them, just all kinds of things. In the name of covetousness, any covetous steward is not reliable and that can hinder his stewardship going forward. It can terminate his stewardship right there, right there. Ask it, has it? Second Kings chapter 5. Kehazi, after Laman's leprosy was healed. Naaman came back, returned with some items to give to Elisha, the man of God, that, that helped, that, pray, that sent him to go and wash. And he got healed. He came back with a lot of things. And Bobo uh, Gehazi. Bobo Gehazi saw all that Elisha refused to take. And he tried to corner it. And he cornered Lehman's leprosy. His stewardship ended that day. His stewardship was terminated, was not acceptable from that day. Be careful of that. The flip side of it is this, and I'm going to wrap up now. It's not just that what belongs to your master is not yours. What your master gave you to give others is not also yours. Politicians, hear me well. Pastors, business owners, business leaders, hear me well. Anyone in leadership, fathers, mothers, hear me well. Some parents are fond of taking any money given to their children. Somebody gives you money and say, please, for your son's fifth birthday, for your daughter's seventh birthday, and then the daughter never sees the seventh day, the money. Be a good steward. Create an account for them. Every money goes in there. Or you go and minister. And they say, hey, thank you for coming. Please uh, give. Uh, we are sowing a seed to your wife's life or your, to your husband's life. And then you say, I am my husband. We are one. And then you call it. <laughs> no. That's not being a good steward. That's not being a good steward. There is a scripture I, I saw that <laughs> I'm glad I saw as a younger man. I'm still young, amen. Jeremiah 17 11. I think I'll close with this scripture. Don't corner what is your boss, what belongs to your boss, into your pocket. And don't corner what belongs to your constituents. The people giving you are giving charge over. Whatever belongs to them, give it to them. This scripture always keeps me in check. Jeremiah 17, 11. Jeremiah 17, 11. I'd like us to read it together. In fact, if you want to highlight it in your Bible, you can highlight it. This one should keep you away from covetousness. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, 
and verse 11, the Bible says, As the partridge seated on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his hand shall be a fool. As a partridge, a bird, seated on his eggs to hatch them, and is not able to accomplish them. So is anyone that gets riches the wrong way, he will leave them here on earth, and he will die young. And at the end, he will be a fool. Because he would have missed the blessings here on earth, and he will miss heaven because of that. So make sure any riches you are getting, you get them by right. You get them by right. It's very important. Don't end your stewardship. What is meant for the flock is not meant for your food. If you eat the food of a flock, you will end up as a fool. Jeremiah 17 verse 11. What is meant for your master is not meant for you. Beware of covetousness. It can disqualify you from stewardship. What was given to you can be taken and given to another when or if a steward is found to be covetous. May the Lord help us in Jesus' mighty name. Let's bow our heads and thank the Lord this evening for his word that he has sent to us. Let's give Jesus all the praise and glory. Father, we thank you and we bless your name tonight. Thank you for the word that you have sent to us. These four different areas. Now we know who a steward is. We know how to offer acceptable stewardship. We know the kind of stewardship. And we know the hindrances to stewardship. Father, we thank you for your understanding that you have given to us. Thank you because we will be doers of your word and not just hear us alone. Give God thanks and praise. Can you do something for me? I want you to thank God for any new thing you learned today. And can you also thank God for any new thing you are going to do after this service? Any new thing you are going to do from what you have learned today? Give God thanks. Father, thank you for opening our eyes, for turning us from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. Blessed be your holy name forever. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. I can't close this service without giving somebody an opportunity to give their hearts to Jesus. And to make him the Lord and Savior of their lives. So if you are under the sound of my voice, maybe this is your first time ever. Or maybe this is yet another time. And you want to say to Jesus, Jesus save my soul. I want to be your child. I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. Please, may I ask that you rise up on your feet if you can and bow your heads and close your eyes and say this prayer of faith right after me. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I come to you today just the way I am. I am a sinner and I cannot help myself. So I've come to you, the Savior, to please help me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins and wash me with your blood. And make me your child again. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. That Jesus Christ. Is Lord. Now I know. That I'm saved. I'm born again. I am now a child of God. And I'm free. From the power of sin. To serve the living God. Thank you Lord. For saving me. 
Amen. Please keep your eyes closed and your head bowed as I pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these ones who have come to you tonight. Or whatever time zone it is in their place, thank you for bringing them to you. I ask and pray that the same grace that brought them forward will keep them in you for life, all the days of their lives. I pray that sin will not have to be known about them anymore. And the grace to live for you is released upon them. In the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that on the last day when you come to take us all home, may our garments be white as snow, may no iniquity be found in us, and may we remain ready and rapturable to live with you when you come to take us home. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. If you said that prayer of faith with me, congratulations. You are now born again. You are now a child of God. And I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to disciple you. So please reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. And let us know that you made that informed decision today to give your heart to Jesus. We have an active discipleship curriculum that we're going to walk you through. And I believe, God, that it will be a profit and a benefit to your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So reach out to us. You can also send us an email at newbirth at tola.org. Newbirth at tola.org. That information is also scrolling at the bottom of your screen right now. Take advantage of that information. And the Lord bless you as you do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just another quick reminder that this Saturday we are going to be having two different programs. We're going to have our Power and Breakthrough Night, followed by our Women's Conference. Our Power and Breakthrough Night is our vigil, the last Friday or last Saturday morning of every month. We take our time to pray according to God's instruction. The Bible says Jesus, a great while before morning, often separated himself and then he prayed. So at 2 a.m. on Saturday, the 26th of August, we're going to be praying and we're going to be meeting in the afternoon at 2 p.m. for the second women's annual women's conference of this ministry. It's going to be an awesome time in God's presence. The theme is Arise. You and all that belongs to you will arise. You will no longer be found in the low places of the earth. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Take advantage of every electronic platform to join, to connect to that service. It will truly bless your life. God's servant, Prophet Ezekiel today, Sado, is going to be ministering. And on Sunday, she will also be ministering with us. Amen. Bringing in the word of life. And I believe, God, that um, it shall be a great time in God's presence. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. All right. So there will be no weekend family breakfast prayer this saturday we're only meeting at 2 a.m on saturday at 2 p.m on saturday all at the eastern on the eastern standard time zone 2 a.m eastern standard time and 2 p.m eastern standard time in jesus name amen praise god let's appreciate the love one more time again father thank you for today's service thank you for everyone that you brought Thank you for the word that you sent. Thank you for your for accepting us, for accepting our prayers, for accepting our offerings, for accepting our giving, for accepting our presence. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Thank you for everyone that you brought live and for those who yet watch this service online. To you alone be all the glory and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Glory be to God. I say to you today, in the name of Jesus, Go, and the Lord be with you. First Samuel 17, 37. Go, and the Lord be with you. The Lord keep you. 
The Lord preserve you. The Lord protect you. The Lord defend you. The Lord lift you up. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everything that has been done to harm you will fail. Everyone that has been sent to harm you will fall. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everything that has been fashioned to harm you or your family, your business, your career, your health, your finances, your relative friends and loved ones, they will fail. In the name of Jesus. And anyone sent from the powers of darkness, from hell, from the devil himself, to hurt you, to harm you, to harm your family members, friends and loved ones, to harm your interests and all that concerns you, they will stumble and fall in the name of Jesus. Go in peace. The Lord God be with you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's share the grace and fellowship with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. And surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Peace. Is it well with you and your family? Is it well with your spirit, soul, and body? Yes, it is well. Is it well with every rest of your life? Yes, it is well. Is it well with you forever? Yes, it is well. And so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us once again. My name is Pastor Diran, and I'm the lead pastor here at the House of Light Assembly. And I'd like to say this to you prophetically and with all sincerity, that no matter what you're going through right now, no matter the circumstances you are in, don't forget these three things. Number one, God loves you. Number two, Jesus is Lord. And number three, Jesus is coming back very soon. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.